In this video, we're going to be talking about Katiri Tekakwitha, which was not her original name, and we're going to be talking about her difficult but wonderful conversion to the Catholic Church, how that came about, and the really difficult circumstances that she faced in life. And she teaches us that no matter what circumstances you have, uh, no matter what sufferings you have, no matter what trials you have, you can live a holy and joyful life for Christ. And so we're going to talk about her right after this. My name is Brian Mercy, a president of Catholic Truth. If you haven't been here before, welcome. We want to help you to know, love, and live your Catholic faith with purpose and passion and even be able to defend it. In this video, we're going to be talking about Katiri Tekakwitha, and I'm very excited about this young girl's life. The year was 1656, and she was born here right in the United States, in central New York. And at that time, there were five Indian tribes who had come together centuries before, but they were living together as one tribe, and they made a pact in 1200 not to attack each other and to kind of be friends with each other. And so these five tribes came together in a pact, in a treaty, and they were called the Iroquois. And this is what uh, Katiri was born into. In fact, she was part of the Mohawk tribe, which was the fiercest by far of the five tribes. But she was different than the Mohawk. She was very sweet. She was very kind. She was very peaceful and loving, which, I mean, she did have their stubborn fierceness as well, but she was much different to them then because her mother was a Catholic. And in fact, the Mohawks used to raid and kidnap Christians uh, all throughout their area and bring them back and either torture them or make them slaves. And one of these women that they had captured and made a slave would become uh, the mother to the chief because one of the great warriors of the Mohawk tribe actually took a liking to her and they ended up getting married and this warrior ended up becoming chief of the whole tribe. And so they had a daughter and her name was Katiri, but not Katiri at the time. Her name originally was Iorogod, which means sunshine or little sunshine. Now, the Indians hated Christians. They especially hated the Jesuits who used to come to try to evangelize them and share the gospel with them, teach them, just teach them, educate them, and actually serve them. They would go around the camp and serve them. But they, at, at first, they refused to have anything to do with the white man, especially the Jesuits. They did not like these people at all. And so they would attack them and kill them many times, even when they allowed the Jesuits to come into the tribes many times, you know, because the government wanted them there. Well, many times they would allow them, but then they would also go and burn and pillage their, their, their houses and their villages, and they would kill them and torture them and that sort of thing. So it became a problem. But we'll come back to that in a minute. When Katiri was four years old, smallpox broke out and killed pretty much everybody she knew. Her family, her mom, her dad, her family, everyone she knew. And it even scarred her. She had scars all over her face. Uh, and she would suffer from not blindness, but severe diminishment of her sight for the rest of her life. It severely affected her. And where she was a joyful sunshine uh, before, she became more serious after this, more reserved. She was probably in a lot of pain as a kid for a long time. She didn't feel like going out and playing with the kids, so they would come in and visit her from time to time, and she would just make herself busy around the house. Eventually, because of this, uh, the chief's brother had to adopt her, and so she was adopted by him and his wife, and he ended up becoming chief of the whole tribe, so she was still the daughter of the chief, and he ended up changing her name to Tekakwitha, Tekakwitha, and T-E-K-A, K-W-I-T-H-A. So it's like actually like three different words, but tekakwitha, which means she pushes it. And he named her this because despite uh, a lot of her limitations and the way she looks and her, their concerns that she might not get married because of the way she looks, the, the chief of the tribe said, no, she has a lot of gifts that a lot of these men would love. She's hardworking. She's diligent. She's intelligent. And when she puts her mind to something, she is like stubborn and she's fierce and she can accomplish it. She pushes it. So tekakwitha means she gets it done. She can do it. She can accomplish it. So again, around this time, the Mohawks often raided Christians and kidnapped kids and brought them into slavery and killed and pillaged and burned and that sort of thing. And they even did so to the Jesuits, who they hated. And eventually the French government got tired of this because they're sending people peacefully and they're just killing people and torturing them. And so the French government sent 1,200 soldiers to 
take care of the problem. Now, it's important to note that they tried to do this peacefully. They did not come to kill anybody. They did not come to kidnap anyone or put anyone in jail or take any of the Indians hostage or anything like that. No, they just sent a, a force that was big enough that would scare the living daylights out of all of them. And they ended up just running for their lives. The Indians didn't even try to fight back against such a force and they just ran and ran. And the French burnt all of their villages and burnt their, their houses to the ground and that sort of thing, just to kind of teach them a lesson like, hey, here's your warning sign. Stop killing our people. We're not at war with you. Just stop killing us, please. And after that, they made a treaty with the French government and they allowed the Jesuits and the priests to come in and peacefully preach to the people. I mean, in public, the, the Mohawks said you could not preach the Catholic faith in public. You could not live the Catholic faith. You couldn't live the Christian faith at all. That's why Tekakwitha's mother, who was a Catholic, had to do so in secret. And there was only one other Catholic in the village, another Catholic lady that they used to talk to and they used to um, pray with and that sort of thing. And they used to kind of influence Tekakwitha a little bit. And so that's where she got her foundation for becoming Catholic and what she would eventually become Catholic because she noticed a clear difference difference between the black robes, the Jesuits, who used to come in and they were so joyful and loving and they used to talk to everybody and the, <laughs> the Mohawks and the other tribes used to literally just grumble and just not even look at them or not even like them. They just did not like these black robes, so they pretty much ignored them. They were mean. They were rude, whereas the, the Jesuits were very nice. They were kind. They would serve people, and so she saw a distinction. She would hear sometimes the priests teaching people about God and saying that God makes no distinction between race or nationality or people. God loves everyone the same. We are all his sons and daughters, whereas in the Indian tribes, they used to brutally kill each other and try to you know, ravage and pillage each other's tribes. In, in this case, the Iroquois had to come together, but many other times they just killed each other. And in fact, when they took over another Indian tribe or even non-Indians, they would put the people in cages and they would fiercely torture them every night. Every night. It was a dis it was a display. It was a it was a spectacle for the whole town. The men, the women, the Indian children, they all used to come to see the capture and the torture of prisoners. And they used to delight in the torture of prisoners. The, the screaming and the wailing, the more the better. Of course, many times they didn't get that, especially if they were Indians, because from a very young age, the Indians would put super hard, I don't want to use the word penances, but they used to discipline themselves from a very young age, do very difficult things. They used to torture themselves when they were young from kids, so that by the time they were adults, they could endure most any kind of torture and they would not scream and they would not yell and they would not wail like their captors would want them to. And they would take it like a champ, so to speak. They would take it in the chin. And uh, many of these Indian tribes were so fierce and so stubborn that even under the fiercest tortures, they would not scream. They would not give the captors the benefit of that. But nonetheless, the, the men, women, children, they all got brutally drunk and they would just revel in the tortures. And in fact, they would get drunk at other times too. I believe they called it like... Um, I can't remember the exact term. It was like white man's fire or something. They would blame the white man for giving them these booze and making them all crazy because then they would go, you know, do all kinds of crazy things. But they would keep doing it. And Tekakwitha did not like it because they would even fight each other. They would just go crazy when they were drunk. And so she noticed the difference of how... Uh, immoral and unvirtuous they were in almost in every way versus the black robes who were teaching love, who were teaching peace, who were teaching kindness, and who were even loving to these people even when they weren't loved in return. Even in the old days, and if you go to modern day New York today, you'll see the Shrine of Divine Martyrs where the people had their fingers bitten off one by one by these Indians in order to torture them. And they would torture them every single day until they couldn't take it anymore and they would die. And that's not just for, you know, non-Indian people, the black robes, the priests, the missionaries. That was for Indian people as well. They torture them until they died. And so Katiri saw this huge difference and she would wonder why the God who made all of us and loves all of us the same would would he permit this kind of action? Would he want us to treat each other that way? So she started relating to her Catholic mom and the lady, the other lady who helped her out after her parents died, and she started relating to that faith a lot more. It made a lot more sense to her that she wanted to know this kind of a God. She wanted to know a loving God. She wanted to be a loving person. She would often get um, made fun of by her own tribe for being uh, less. I mean, she wasn't a full Mohawk, and they would always let her know that, oh, well, her mom was a weak 
you know, non-Mohawk. Of course she's not going to love this. Of course she's not going to love the torture. They used to make fun of her a lot for this, but she just couldn't give in to that. I mean, it takes a lot to actually torture children and to revel in it. I mean, okay, maybe men, and sure, yeah, maybe women, even so, but children, they had no discrimination. They tortured everyone. And it was at that moment, one night, when they were all drunk and doing this, that she came to the conclusion that what her tribe was doing was wrong and that God would not want to treat people that way. If he loved everyone, then even if we disagree, we should not treat other people like that. We should love everyone in return. Totally contrary to this, the true God, the Iroquois worshiped the God of war, who is known as the eater of flesh and the drinker of blood. So they truly believed that all of this torture and murder would please their God, who is the eater of flesh and the drinker of blood. They believed it pleased him, appeased him. Because Katiri was the only one who would not take part in it, and she went back and she tried to find excuses to stay in the house and to work and to, to, to knit and that sort of thing, her aunts and other people in the village tried to break her. They, they did not like the fact that she seemed to be a little too cozy with the priests or with their Catholic you know, upbringing. They did not like that because they didn't like Christians in the first place, so they kind of wanted to break her of this. So you have two opposing forces right here going on in the Iroquois tribe. You have, on the one hand, the Jesuits who are really starting to make some success. They're serving people. People are seeing their unconditional love and how wonderful they are. And the, the Indians, are, some of them are starting to come to God and wanting to be educated in the faith. And they would start to be taught. Whereas on the other side, uh, her family was starting to torture her. They would introduce her to like secular dancing and, and to boys and to all of these things that she really didn't want to be a part of. They sent her to extravagant parties, kind of to drown out the spiritual in her. She did not want to have anything to do with what her aunts wanted. And it was really painful for her to try to do all of these things. They gave her extra work. They, they gave her less food. They would give her all these activities that in extra... It was basically like a Cinderella in some sense. They would make her like Cinderella. They were trying to make her life a living house so she would break and succumb to the Iroquois way of life. But something really big happened. You, the, everyone knows that the Iroquois conquered the Mohicans, you know, the last of Mohicans. <laughs> they destroyed the Mohicans. And the chief, the war chief, who was responsible for conquering that whole tribe and leading the armies into battle, came to the village one day as a Christian. The chief savage warlord who conquered Indian, other Indian tribes converted to Christianity, and it was like a bomb in the Iroquois village. I mean, this man had left, and he had found a peaceful uh, village of where Indians would go to learn from the Jesuits. And the Jesuits up in this area, they had a, their own little village, and it was they had a church in the middle, and then they had their own little wigwams around it, and they all lived in complete peace. They all lived in love. They all lived in kindness. They all lived in a, with a spirit of brotherly love where it didn't matter who you were, you were just loved by God. And this war chief was converted and ended up sending shockwaves through many of the villagers. Not only that, but he left behind his savage ways and went to the village to live there as one of them. Like, nobody would ever have thought of this. Whereas before, this war chief, who hated Christianity with all of his hate, somehow ended up becoming one of them. I mean, this just shows that God can heal the hardest of hearts, the, the, the people who hate the most. He can work in their lives. Contrast that with Tekakwitha, who was being tortured by her aunts, who she wanted to stay inside on Sundays and, you know, not do everything that the Iroquois did. You know, she said it's against the Lord. It's against the Lord's day. And the more religious she became, the harsher they became on her. The more of uh, evil stepmother, in a sense, they were like to this Cinderella. And in fact, they said, if you're not going to do what we do on Sundays, then you will not eat. And so she didn't. She fasted for the entire day on Sunday, minus a few corner kernels of corn, she would not eat. And on other days, they made her fast as well, to the point where she was becoming so weak she could hardly stand at points. And the dad did not like the fact that they were torturing her, so he commanded them to stop and to figure out other ways to make uh, 
her break or to do it in nice ways. Like he was really harsh on them and told them they better cut it out. And so she actually had a reprise for a while. She was, you know, allowed to be free for a while, but then they found other ways to go about it. They started spreading gossip about her around town. They got the whole entire village against her. They started spreading rumors against her. Um, all, I mean, can you imagine if your town Someone in town sp spread rumors about you, and everywhere you went, people looked at you suspiciously and whispered against you and gossiped against you. I mean, that would be hard. Would you not want to move? We see this online today with cyberbullying and that sort of thing. It's really hard, and yet she endured all of these. She was a Mohawk. I mean, she had the fierceness of her father, and she refused to break. Once she put her mind to loving God and wanting to learn the Christian faith, she would not break, as nice and kind as she was. And that this just made them mad and it made them go harder on her and she would dig her heels into the ground and she would be fierce and she would not bend. She would be loving. She would be kind. She would greet them. They said, you're not going to eat all day then. She would be like, that's okay. I won't eat. You know, in her mind, Jesus suffered out of love for her. So she was happy to suffer out of love for him. Jesus was put on the cross. Jesus was made to do things against his will. So in her mind, when she was made to do things against her will, it was her little gift that she could give God. And she offered all of these things up for Jesus, her Savior, Jesus, her Lord, who she was learning so much about. Eventually, it came to a point where the aunts were harassing her so much that she just decided to become a Christian. I mean, things were about to get worse, but she had to do it secretly, and she became a Christian. And she not only wanted to become a Christian, but they said, you, with how much they're persecuting you now, as you are not a Christian, if you become a Christian, that may end up killing you. I mean, right now, your health is so bad. Right now, sometimes you can't even get out of bed. Right now, I mean... So many, so many times she kept contracting sicknesses one after another and she had to be in bed and be served. And I mean, when she wasn't in bed, all she did all day, all she wanted to do was a few things. Number one, pray and serve other people. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. The, but they said, you know what? You need to get away. You need to run away from your family if you become a Christian because they are going to continue to harass you and persecute you for the rest of your life. They're not going to give in. So she did. So she ended up going to the village of the Christians and she ended up becoming baptized and she ended up receiving, oh, she had to wait a year to receive the Eucharist. That was the rule because they wanted to make sure that the savage people who were extremely savage at the time, they wanted to make sure that they could truly live the Christian gospel. And they were really serious about living a life of love and, you know, getting rid of the ways of killing and murder and torture and all of that sort of thing. And so what they would do is they would instruct them and help them. And then if they were really serious and they made great progress, they would be able to receive the Eucharist and just being baptized, just being uh, able to receive our Lord in the Eucharist gave her the the most amount of ecstasy and joy that a person can have. Already she was doing great penances for Jesus. She would offer everything up and extra things for him out of love. So she was already living the Christian faith. So after she was baptized and she received and, and confirmed and all that, and she received her name Katiri, and we, that's why we know her name as Katiri Tekakwitha, and she became a Catholic and she would end up fleeing. They wanted her to get far away um, because, I mean, obviously these were Indians. They can track anyone. And so they wanted to go to Canada and just get her far away so she could live her own life. And in fact, uh, somebody heard about this and they went to tell the chief tribe. And they had already left a long time ago, started heading to Canada. They knew they would be tracked down like hounds and they knew they would be caught. So they had to create this whole plan of diversion uh, where two hours, I mean, they even tracked it to like almost the minute. They're like, it's going to take them two and two hours and some odd minutes to track us down and kill us. And so we have to create a diversion. And so what they did is Tekakwitha and a couple others hid in the woods. And one of the other Indians, because the the the, um, the chief really didn't know these people very well, so he didn't know that they were helping her. So one of them posed as a hunter who was lost. And he's like, I'm trying to kill a squirrel. And he was just on that branch. And I, I missed him. I was like, did you see him? And the chief you know, was talking to him like, you missed a squirrel at that range? What kind of a hunter are you? And he started they just thinking he was like this crazy loony guy. And um, anyways, he just ignored him and kept going past. And once he kept going past, 
Then the guy who was pretending went to get Tekakwitha and then the other priest, and they ended up continuing their journey all the way to Canada where they escaped, and they had villages up there where they lived in harmony, where they lived in community, and she prayed every day. I mean, <clears throat> she prayed like every day. She went to Mass four to five times a day sometimes just to pray in the church or go to church, and this is with, like winter time. Like she couldn't feel her legs, she couldn't feel her hands, and yet she would kneel in the church where she could see that just the clear smoke of her breath. And she would just want to be close to Jesus. Many times she would leave the village and she would go down uh, where this tree kind of came over and she would pray under there and she typed her initials in there, you know, Tekakwitha loves Jesus and that sort of thing. And she would just have this dream of wanting to live her whole life for Jesus. And then she heard about nuns and she wanted to live in community as nuns. And she got a, a few other people who would want to live in community with her. And they wanted to start this order where they just live for Jesus. They prayed all day. They fasted. They worked in the fields. They served the poor. They served the needy. She wanted to give her whole life to Jesus. So they went and talked to one of the priests there, the Jesuit priest, the black robes, and he denied it. He said, no, you guys you are just starting out on this journey. You can't just start an order. He's like, you're far too young. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to do it. And yes, there is an island of nuns right over there, you know, but, you know, it takes some time to discern it. And after some time, they all realized that, you know, he was right. You know, they really didn't know what they were doing. They were acting hastily, but... Kateri still kind of wanted to give her whole life to Jesus. And so she told the priest that she wanted to live a, a vow of celibacy, like the nuns. She wouldn't live in community with them, but she was going to take a secret vow of virginity. And so she did. And he allowed her to after some <laughs> convincing. And she ended up um, making a pact to Jesus where she wouldn't get married. She wouldn't do any of that worldly stuff and she would give her whole life to him. And she did. And in fact, a lot of the people in the community started gossiping against her because there were some rumors that came out that an older man may have been doing stuff with her and it was a huge scandal. She never defended herself. She just kept praying and the black robes came over and started questioning her and you know, and eventually she was exonerated. But she, throughout her whole life, Katiri had persecutions. She had trials. She had sufferings. I mean, she already had health issues and she was still taking on huge fasts and mortifications, even where she would whip herself until the, the priests were like, okay, you're doing too much. You know, you're going to kill yourself. Stop whipping yourself and stop bringing blood out of yourself. That is not what God wants from you. And still, even though she was sick, even though she couldn't even get out of bed for months sometimes, she would still fast and give herself penances. She's like, Jesus suffered for me every moment until he died. So I'm going to suffer for him every moment of my life, whether I die or not. And she did. And eventually, <clears throat> I think it was all this heavy penances that eventually led her to her premature death. She was known for saying, I just need a little food and a couple pieces of clothing. More than this, I do not want in life. All she wanted was her Jesus. Every moment of every day, she loved Jesus. She's a great example to us that no matter what sufferings you have, I mean, she had joy and peace in her her soul despite all of this. She would she had a resolute devoutness, a discipline, a fervor, and a stubbornness, which was used in the right way to serve our Lord. And so we can do the same thing no matter what circumstances come up in our life, no matter what sufferings, no matter what catastrophes, no matter what injustices, things that don't go our way, but things that are unfair in life. You know, we can offer them up out of love for Christ. We can offer everything up out of love for Christ. And through our prayer life, we can use it to come into great deep union with him. She still cared for her people so much so that she would walk on the frozen lakes barefoot saying the rosary <laughs> for the conversion of her people. I mean, she was hardcore. Are we hardcore? How much do we give to Christ today? How much do we give to him in prayer? Do we give him the bare minimum? Do we give him our leftovers? Do we give him a few minutes at night if we have time? She gave him everything, and the saints are such an example to us to give everything we have to Christ. She ended up dying in 1680 when she was only 24 years old, and she is a legacy, a memorial for young people who can live for Christ. She started living for Christ when she was a teenager. She gave her whole life to Christ when she was around 20 and or a little before that, and she ended up dying when she was 24, totally in love and totally a saint for Christ. And now she's living in glory and majesty with him in heaven. So Katiri Tekukwitha, 
against all persecutions, against all sufferings. She was a great light. She was, in fact, a little sunshine to everyone around her. She served everyone around her, loved everyone around her, even those who persecuted her. She was a great example of Jesus Christ, who loved everyone around him, even to the cross. Thank you so much for watching this video today. If you loved this uh, story and you want to hear even more inspiring stories of saints, check out our other videos, especially Blessed Margaret of Costello. That video will blow you away. Her story is even more amazing, in my opinion. Also, St. Francis de Sales, who converted 60,000 Protestants back to the Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation. An amazing story. St. Catherine of Siena and others. We will link them below um, or at the end, if we remember. And please check these out. They will continue to inspire you in your faith. And if you haven't checked out our website yet with our t-shirts, uh, please check out our website, thecatholictruth.org. And if you haven't checked, uh, if you would like us to come to your parish, to speak at your parish, to give a retreat, to talk on the saints, please check out our website, catholictruth.org. And uh, check out everything down below in our show description notes. If you haven't followed us on social media yet, uh, if you haven't supported us on PayPal or Patreon, we would be eternally grateful so that we could continue doing this ministry that we do. Thanks so much for watching and God bless.